So in this audio clip, we'll discuss very briefly the overview summary of Surah At-Tawbah, and inshallah, we'll get into the tafsir of certain ayat of the surah. Starting with the name Surah At-Tawbah, Tawbah in the Arabic language means repentance. And the reason why the surah is given this name is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that he forgave, that he pardoned the Tawbah and the repentance of his believing slaves. And certain believing slaves, some certain Sahaba radiallahu are referred to in the surah, uh, specifically those Sahaba that were uh, left behind in the Ghazwa and the campaign of Tabuk. And they delayed, they procrastinated, and eventually they did not participate. They were boycotted for 50 days, and thereafter they made Tawbah. Uh, during this time they made Tawbah, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted their Tawbah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that he accepted their Tawbah repentance. So therefore the surah is given this name. This surah is the one of the last surahs revealed upon Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa in his life in Medinatul in Medina Munawwara. And according to Barah bin Azib radiallahu anhu, whose narration is mentioned in Sayyid al Bukhari, uh, this is the last surah that was revealed. That the last surah that was revealed is Surah At-Tawbah. This surah, <coughs> the first part of it, was revealed upon Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa at the occasion when he was returning from the Ghazwa, the campaign of Tabuk. And in this campaign, which was a very arduous journey, which was a very difficult time. It was a very great test. It was uh, an imtihan, a very great test for the iman of the Sahaba radiallahu anhu. It, it happened, it occurred during a very intense heat. And the, the journey was also very long. And the fruits were also, the dates of Medina were also ripened. And it was time to pluck them. It was a time to harvest the crops. And these crops would last the Sahaba for the rest of the year. This was the time to harvest and that harvest would last until the next year. And people, naturally, they desired not to go in the path of Allah on this, on this occasion, in the Ghazwa of Tabuk. Although it was an nafir ram, it was a general wide, widespread call where everyone had to come out in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it was a great test for the iman for the, uh, for the iman of Sahaba radiallahu anhu. It was a test for the truthfulness in their iman and their sincerity. And it was a distinguishing factor, this campaign, between the true believers and between the munafiqin and the hypocrites. So when the Prophet sallallahu returned from this journey thereafter. This happened in the ninth year after Hijrah. Ghazwa the book happened in the month of Rajab, in the ninth year after Hijrah. Thereafter, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sent Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu was the Amir of Hajj in the month of Hajj. This was the first Hajj caravan that went from Makkah to Makkah to, sorry, that went from Medina al-Munawwara to Makkah to Makkah in the days of Islam. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sent Abu Bakr was the leader of the Hajj caravan so that he could teach the people that were together for Hajj, the rights of Deen, the rights of, of Hajj according to Islam, the way to fulfill all the, uh, the acts of worship in Hajj according to the Islamic way. And when Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu returned, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa followed up by sending Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu anhu as a messenger on behalf of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa to teach the people the ahkam and the rulings of Surah At-Tawbah. Now, there are two main subject matters uh, that are dealt with in this surah. The first is to explain the Islamic law and ruling with regards to how the mushrikeen, uh, the, the polytheists, the Arab mushrikeen were to be dealt with in Jazirat al-Arab and also the Ahlul Kitab in the Arabian Peninsula. The second subject matter of the surah is to expose and to make apparent what was the condition of the hearts when the widespread general call was made for all the people, all the Muslims in Medina to come out of Medina for the expedition of Tabuk uh, against the Romans. So how the hearts reacted and uh, therefore the exposure of who the true believers were and who the open hypocrites were based on how they reacted to this call of striving in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As far as the first subject matter goes, the surah talks about the pledges and the peace treaties that existed between the Muslims and many of the non-Muslim groups, the Mushrikeen Arab tribes, and also the, uh, the Ahlul Kitab, the Jews. So prior to the surah, in the days of Islam, from the time that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made Hijrat to Medinatul Munawwara, there were many groups, many non-Muslim groups with whom the Muslims had a peace treaty and agreement with. So obviously the Muslims had a peace treaty agreement with all the Jewish tribes because the Jewish tribes lived in Medina Munawwara and to create peace and harmony between the Muslims and the Jews, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi made a peace treaty with all the Jewish tribes, Banu Qaynaqa, Banu Nadir, uh, Banu Quraidha, all of these. There were peace treaties made with the Mushrikeen Arabs of Mecca, the Quraysh. And this happened uh, specifically in the sixth year after Hijrah on the occasion of Hudaybiyah where there was an agreement that for 10 years there would be no war between the two of them. And there were many other peace treaties that, are, that were made also with other tribes outside of Makkah to Makarramah, for example, the Banu Mudlij tribe. And there were many groups with whom there was no peace treaty at all, with whom there was no peace treaty at all, no, no agreement between the Muslims and them. Now, the Muslims, while living in, in Medina to Manawara, they had experienced many treacheries 
uh, by the non-Muslim groups, many of these groups with whom they have peace treaties with. These people, many of them, these groups, they kept on breaking their pledges. They kept on breaking their peace treaties and agreements that they had made with the Muslims by outwardly attacking the Muslims or by uh, behind the Muslims' backs, backstabbing them by supporting uh, other groups to attack the Muslims. For example, what the Jews did many occasions, they backstabbed the Muslims on the occasion, for example, Ahzab, when they allied with uh, the Quraysh of Mecca and they helped them by breaking, breaking their pledges by breaking their pledges with the Muslims. For example, this happened specifically, uh, this was done specifically by the tribe of al Quraydah. Uh, so this happened and even the Mushrikeen of the Arabs, the, sorry, the Mushrikeen of Quraysh, they had also broken their peace treaty after, shortly after um, the peace treaty was made with them on the occasion of Hudaybiyah, the next year they also broke their peace treaty. And there were some who, there were groups that never broke their peace treaty and agreement. They never violated uh, the dictates of the of the agreement that they had with the Muslims. For example, the Banu Mudlij tribe. And there were some, for example, like we mentioned, that never had a peace treaty and agreement with the Muslims in the first place. So it would it made no sense for Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and for the Muslims to uphold their part of the agreement uh, when it came to the peace treaty and the deals that they had with those groups the, the Jews of Medina and the Quraysh of Mecca, it was no, it made no sense for Nabi Sallallahu and the Muslims to uphold their side of the bargain when on the other side they had kept, they kept on continuously breaking their pledges and breaking uh, the, the demands of the peace treaty. So in this surah, Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala makes an announcement that this is how the, everyone's going to be deal, dealt with now. There's going to be a, big, there's going to be a new policy because now the Muslims had complete control of the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, they had control of Mecca after the conquest of Mecca in the after Hijra, they obviously. Uh, Medina obviously belonged to the Muslims, and likewise, the surrounding areas were also coming under Muslim control, like Taif and so on. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made a proclamation through the surah that now all of the mushrikeen Arabs, the, poly, the Arab polities, they will have either one of two choices. Either if they wish to stay on Arab lands in the Arabian Peninsula, they will have to become Muslim, or if they don't, if they don't, then they'll have to leave the Arabian Peninsula. Otherwise, there will be a uh, war against them. And, for the, and they will be given a, a grace period of four months. They will be given a, a grace period of four months. As far as uh, those groups who had never broke, broken their, their side of the agreement, who had never broken uh, the peace treaty that existed between them and the Muslims, like the Banu Mudlij, Mudlij tribe, for example, the Banu Mudlij tribe, those kind of people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructed Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to keep, um, to uphold that peace, peace, peace treaty, to uphold that agreement, that whatever time period that that peace treaty and agreement was, was for, to, to fulfill that peace treaty up to the end of that time period. So for example, they had a time period of nine months. So up to the nine month, at the end of the nine month period, Nabi Sallallahu and the Muslims, they upheld their side of the agreement and didn't, they didn't touch them and they didn't bother them, they didn't expel them from the lands, they didn't do anything to them. Okay. Uh, so this was with relation to the first subject matter uh, of the surah. The second subject matter, like we mentioned, deals with exposure of what was contained in the hearts of the Muslims in, in uh, Medina al Munawwara, when the general call was made for all the Muslims to come out in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the campaign of Tabuk. So, specifically, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exposed the hearts of the Munafiqeen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exposed the hearts of the, the hypocrites. So, with respect to the kind of the kind of groups that formed when Nabi Sallallahu made a widespread call to come out for the campaign of Tabuk, like we mentioned, it was a very difficult campaign because it was it, there was intense heat, the fruits were ripe, it was a very long journey. And the Roman forces were also very mighty and they were known to be very strong and very well equipped. So it was naturally a very difficult test for the Iman of Sahaba. So three groups formed. One, one group was those Muslims, those sincere Sahaba who responded to the call right away and they said, we're ready and they came out in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second group was those who initially were reluctant and hesitant, were initially um, not compliant right away, but eventually they also came out in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The third group were those people who without a legitimate excuse they stayed behind they kept on procrastinating and eventually they never participated in the campaign and these people for example three sahaba particularly uh Ka'b bin malik hilal bin umayyah and uh Ka'b bin malik hilal bin umayyah and murara bin rabi these three sahaba anhum, they were boycotted for 50 days after nabi sallallahu returned from tabuk and they thereafter their toba was accepted so this was the third group and then there was a fourth group who stayed behind and they had no legitimate excuse for staying behind and these were the hypocrites and they when Nabi Sallallahu came back they started to make all kinds of excuses that always oh, stayed behind for this reason for this reason for this reason the Nabi Sallallahu just outwardly accepted their excuses and let them be to their to their state the third group of Sahaba who we mentioned who procrastinated and never participated in the campaign they never made excuses to Nabi Sallallahu when Nabi Sallallahu came back they accepted uh, they admitted to their faults 
And they said, you know, we had no excuse. We had no reason to not join. It was just that we procrastinated and we kept on thinking we'll join tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. And we never did. And because of that, they were boycotted for 50 days. And then thereafter, the Toba was accepted. So Allah SWT specifically in the surah exposes more so the fourth category of people who are the open hypocrites. Uh, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the ayat and the surah disgraces them and openly talks about them and their habits and their qualities and their unwillingness to help the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at any occasion. Uh, to the point where Sahaba would say that this surah talked so much of the hypocrites and those that stayed behind and their evil qualities and habits that we were able to openly recognize each and every one of them and point them out with our fingers because it exposed them so openly. For example, Allah says, uh, that, that if it was some merchandise which was close and a journey which was not so distant, then they would follow you. And anyway, like, like all of these kind of statements Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes to expose the condition of the, of the hypocrites, the munafiqeen. And th therefore, this is also a reason why uh, Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu anhu is reported to have said that one of the names of the surah is Al-Fadiha, the one which disgraced, uh, which disgraced the hypocrites by openly exposing their condition. Moving on, inshallah, we will get into the tafsir of some of the ayat in the surah. So the first ayah uh, I want to discuss is, is the one in which Allah Azza wa Jalla mentions "Arrudu billahi min ash-shaytanir rajim." Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. "Qul in kana abaukum wa abnaukum wa ikhwanukum wa azwajukum wa ashiratukum wa amwalu bi qatraftumha wa tijaratun taqshuna kasadha wa masakin tarzuna habba ilaykum min Allahi wa Rasulihi wa jihad fi sabilihi fatarabbasu." Allah says, say, O Prophet of Allah, say to all the Muslims, say to all of the believers, and all the people at large, you can say, more so the believers, in kana that if your fathers, if your fathers and your sons and your brothers and your family members, uh, and your spouses, sorry, and your family members, close family, extended family, all these people, these people who are most dear to you usually, First one, a person's parents uh, are very dear to a person, obviously. A person, in terms of people, looks up to and has most reverence and respect for his parents. And his children are most close to him in the sense that they are the most beloved to him. They have, he has the most love for them, most compassion and care for them. And the, he looks at them as himself because they're his own blood and flesh. And what as wajukum, your spouses, the ones who are your life, uh, your, your, your spouses, your, your soulmates, those that will support you in every adverse condition, every difficult condition. These people are, are next in line in terms of being most close to you. And all of your family members, who you would take help from in any crisis, in any difficulty, who would come to your aid because they consider you to be part of their. These people who naturally a person has an attachment to, who naturally a person has love for, all these kind of people. And then Allah says, And your wealth that you've earned, a person's wealth is very dear to a person. Spent his energy, his resources, his uh, time, and everything to acquire this money, to acquire this wealth. And it's by means of this wealth that a person feels that he's able to um, make himself prosper, to increase his quality of life, to defend himself, to fulfill his needs. This wealth is dear to a person. And the business for which you fear a loss. Kasadaha means that you fear the time when there is no demand for the stock. There's no, there's no market for your commodities. And therefore you have nowhere to earn the profit. Because there's no market, there's no demand, there's no customers. That business for which you fear a loss. Takshona kasadaha. Uh, a person feels a person is attached to his business as much as he's attached to the profits because the purpose of the business is the profits but a person he sees the, the the business as the means for the profits the means for the wealth so the business sometimes is more dear to the person than the actual profit sometimes that comes out of it because the person looks at the fact that the business will get me the this many more profits later on the person's ready to sacrifice put more money into the business he's ready to give away his money for the business because he feels that the business will produce him you know the more he invests in it the more it will pr provide for him and, and give him profits in the future and the dwellings and houses which you are pleased with. Uh, if all of these things, Allah SWT mentions eight things. If these things are more beloved to you than Allah and His Messenger. Meaning, obedience to Allah and His Messenger. Making hijrah, migrating to Allah and His Messenger. Pleasing Allah and His Messenger. If these things are more beloved to you than Allah and His Messenger, then, and striving and struggling in His path, in the path of Allah SWT for assisting and helping the deen of Allah SWT, Allah says, فَتَرَبَّصُوا Then wait. This is a tremendous uh, warning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives. It's a threat. Hatta yati Allahu bi amri until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, his order and his command comes, meaning his punishment. Wallahu la yahdi al-qawm al fasiqin. And Allah does not guide the sinful transgressing group and nation. Wallahu la yahdi al-qawm al fasiqin. Those that come out of his obedience, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah doesn't guide them. And how are they transgressing? How are they disobeying here? 
by pre by preferring the love of their family members and wealth and, and houses and these kind of things over making an effort for the deen of Allah. Over having love for Allah and his messenger, over obedience to Allah and his messenger and, and struggling and striving for, their, for the cause of Allah and his messenger. So this ayah subhanAllah is Mufasibu mentioned that this ayah contains such a grave and a serious warning that there, is, there are very few people that can escape the warning of this ayah. That the things that Allah SWT mentions, a person has natural love, a natural inclination, a natural softness for all of these things. A person's parents, children, spouses, brothers, family members, business, wealth, dwellings, all these different things. A person has a natural love. But the love for Allah and his messenger and Allah and his messenger is a developed love. It's a love which is acquired, it's a love which is worked upon by making an effort on a person's iman, by worship, by obeying and worshiping Allah subhanahu wa more and more, by bringing Allah into a person's life, by making sacrifices, by making sacrifices of one's time and wealth, energies and resources for the deen of Allah subhanahu wa acquired love. Unless if that acquired love is not there by making the sacrifice necessary. And if that love and all and Necessarily, the love of Allah's messenger will necessitate the love of that effort, which will bring alive the mission of Allah's messenger, which is the deen of Allah, which is the jihad fisabi. Now, when I mention that this jihad fisabi is driving the path of Allah in this context, in this ayah, according to the Muslim first specifically migrating, and before the conquest of Makkah, it was an obligation upon all Muslims to migrate to Makkah to Mukarramah. It was followed. Uh, those that were not Muslim, those that were not weak and unable to do so because of extreme conditions, it was necessary to follow. Thereafter, it was not followed after conquest of Makkah, it was not followed anymore. But to this time, to this day, till the end of Qiyamah, uh, it will, when I mention, it will always be followed to make to migrate if necessary to any place uh, where a person will be able to freely practice Islam. If he ends up being, if he is living in a place where uh, it's difficult, where there's oppression and there's persecution, and a person cannot freely and openly practice Islam and fulfill all the, all the commands of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, say to this day, it will be an obligation for this person to migrate to a land where it will be easy and and and, uh, and facilitated for him to practice Islam. So that's according to the first one. This is what the jihad fisabi over here means. But <clears throat> we can take it in a more general and broad sense also that the purpose of migrating, migrating for the sake of Allah, for a land where it's easier to practice, is to establish the deen. Is to establish the deen. That when a person, he's, uh, when a person is migrating, for example, in those days he was migrating to Medina, it was to strengthen the Islamic state of Medina. It was to, uh, it, was, it was to be able to openly give da'wah to the people living in Medina, for example, the Jews. And outside of Medina, it was for the sake of establishing So it can be left uh, general also. So Allah SWT mentions that if uh, these things, the family members, the brothers, the sons, all these things are more beloved to you, then Allah is messenger and striving the path of Allah until Allah SWT brings his, his command and punishment. Allah SWT brings punishment. So it's such a great warning. And that punishment, it will it can be in the akhirah and it can be in this world. And the punishment in this world, the punishment in this world is that Allah SWT will take, will take away the honor, a life of honor, a life of respect from Muslims. And Muslims will have to live in this race. When they don't make an effort for the cause of deen, to promote deen, to spread deen, to, to, to establish the commands of Allah, and so on, When Muslims feel that they have to succumb to the culture around them, then they are not doing this jihad fisabi. When Muslims feel that they have to disobey Allah because their non-Muslim employers said so, or because their non-Muslim associates and friends and business partners and uh, neighbors and People that they're associated with on a communal level, when they say so, because of that they they disobey Allah's messenger, then this is not the jihad fisabi. So jihad fisabi is to represent Islam and to promote Islam wherever a person is. Most importantly, and that is Allah who likes the Quran and Allah never will never guide the uh, disobedience of people. Allah who likes the Quran and Allah. So one one meaning of this ayah is mentioned according to the Muslim is that when a person he gives preference to the love of his uh, children and parents and brothers and spouses and family members and all these things over the love of Allah's messenger and striving for the cause of Allah's messenger, then a person thinks that he is uh, securing his own happiness, he's securing his own dignity and honor and respect, and he's securing his own financial security, he's securing his own uh, he's, he's securing his own position in this world. Unless even that will not happen, because everything all conditions are controlled by Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. That dignity and that respect, that true dignity and respect, the true happiness and tranquility and peace, the true safety, all of these things will not come. All of these things will not come. Even though you think that that'll come by you preferring you know, the love of all these uh, you know, uh, family members and houses and wealth, if you think that's going to come by preferring love of these things over the love of Allah's messenger and striving for the cause, then no, that's not going to happen. Allah will not guide you to, to their objective in this world either. Therefore, Allah subhanahu wa taala mentions that the Nasrallah Allahumma 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 Allahum
about the Sahaba radiallahu anhum and them being the the best and only guides for us and for all the Muslims to the Day of Judgment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that Sabiqoon al Awalun, wa Sabiqoon al Awalun amin al Muhajirina, wal Ansar, wal Ladina Tabiruhum bi Ihsan, radiallahu anhum, wa radu an, wa adalahum jannat in Tajri Tahta al Anharu Khadidina fiha abada, the Arikal Fosul Avim. Allah says, the front runners of the first Sahaba from the emigrants, the Muhajirin and the Ansar, the helpers. Meaning, the first people to accept Islam, the first people to bring Iman, who were the companions of Rasulullah Whether they were from the Muhajirin group, whether they were from the emigrants that migrated from Mecca to Medina, or whether they were the initial residents of Medina, the Ansar, all the Sahaba at large, we can say all the Sahaba. The front runners, the front comers, meaning they were the first group to accept Islam. They were the first group to, to bring Iman. And they were the first to help the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If it wasn't for this first generation of Muslims to help the deen of Allah, Islam would never have such a far reach. Islam would never have reached throughout the entire globe. And Islam would never have uh, survived for so many centuries till today, 1400 years later. If it wasn't for the strength of this first group of Muslims, if it wasn't for their qualities, if it wasn't for their adhering to the basic tenets of Islam firmly, if it wasn't for them dedicating their lives for Islam and giving up everything they did for Islam. The Muhajir Ansar, Allah says them, وَالَّذِينَ اتَّبَعُوهُمْ And those that follow them in the best of ways and the most excellent of matters. Those that tread their path and follow their life example. Uh, who are? Those that follow them will be all the generations that came after. So the first generation that followed the Sahaba were the Tabi'un, who obviously did follow the pattern of Sahaba in their life, who, who, who followed their, their way of life till the uh, end. The generations after that, Atba'u Tabi'in, and the generations all the way till, till now, all the way till the Day of Judgment. Allah says, those, those that will follow their, their lead, those that will follow, follow their example in the best and most excellent of manners. What is Bi'ihsan, best most excellent of manners, is they take whatever good has been passed down from them. So, ulama have mentioned a couple of meanings about Bi'ihsan. One is that Sahaba were human beings, they were not prophets. So, some, they did, some, some of them did make mistakes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala overlooked and pardoned their mistakes. So we do not look at the mistakes of Sahaba. Bi Ihsan means not to criticize the Sahaba, not to look at their mistakes, and not to use that as an example also. That all will do the same because the Sahaba did this and did that. No, what, what was over what was considered a mistake and what was overlooked, that we leave behind. So Bi Ihsan, who follow them in the best of ways, in the best of manners. And another meaning of Bi Ihsan is in the best of ways by uh, looking at the good, talking about the good of the Sahaba and not criticizing and not talking ill of the Sahaba. Not, not, not talking any ill about the Sahaba. That's the other thing. And Allah says, those that follow them in the best and most excellent of manners, radiallahu anhum wa radu'an. That Allah is pleased with them and they are pleased with Allah. Allah is pleased with them means that Allah will promise them, Allah has promised them His forgiveness and His pleasure. That Allah uh, will overlook all of their faults, forgive their shortcomings. And the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the highest reward and the highest accolade that a person can receive, uh, let alone in this world, even in the Akhirah. Sahaba radiallahu anhu received this in this world, in this very world itself. And not only for them, Allah has promised this accolade and this degree, this certification for everyone that will follow them. So we should all be striving, should all be competing to achieve this accolade, to achieve this credential, the pleasure of Allah, which Allah guaranteed for the Sahaba. So if we want to make sure that we're also guaranteed, Allah says very easy, just follow the life, just follow the life of the Sahaba, just follow their path, and Allah will also be pleased. Allah will also be pleased with, with them. Thereafter, Allah says, they are also pleased with him. They are also pleased with him, meaning that obviously they will be pleased with Allah when they see the reward in, on the Day of Judgment in terms of what they will get for their good deeds and the Jannah they will receive and the forgiveness of their sins and all of that they will obviously be pleased with. But even in this world, this was the quality of Sahaba that they were pleased with Allah. They were pleased with whatever uh, decisions and decrees came from Allah. Whatever they were commanded to do from Allah, they didn't question. Whatever the command came, when, when alcohol was made prohibited, they didn't question. When gambling was made prohibited, they didn't question. When women were told to cover their, you know, their bodies, they didn't question. They were pleased with the decrees and the decisions of Allah. When they were faced with difficulties and trials, for example, in Ahzab, when they were when they had to dig the trench, they were feeling cold and they were tying stones to their stomach. They didn't complain. They didn't. They were pleased with the state. Uh, whether they had to leave their hometowns, Mecca to Mukarrama, and, and migrate to Medina, they didn't question. They were pleased with their decision. Whether they had to sacrifice their wealth and give up everything they had in the expedition of Tabuk, Abu Bakr gave everything, Abu Bakr gave half of his wealth, they didn't question. They were pleased with that. Whether they had to give up their lives and whether they had to give up their relationships with their family members for the sake of deen, they didn't question. Abu Baydah ibn Jarrah ended up killing his brother. Musa bin Umayr captured his own brother. Uh, Abu Bakr himself, at one point he said that in the Battle of Badr, if he had an opportunity when his when his son was fighting for the Quraysh, the Mushrikeen of Mecca, and he had an opportunity to, to harm him or to kill him, he would have done so. He wouldn't have questioned. So whatever sacrifices they had to make for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for the deen of Allah, they were pleased 
with making that sacrifice. They were pleased with whatever test that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put them through. They were pleased with whatever they had to give up for the sake of Allah. وَرَضُوا This is the quality we have to bring of Sahaba within our lives. That whatever command of Allah there is, like Sahaba, they willingly, completely submitted to that command and they fulfilled it. We have to have that. This is the way of the Sahaba by which they gained Allah's pleasure. And if we want Allah's pleasure, we have to do the same. And whatever they were told to give up, they gave it up in question. If we want the pleasure of Allah, like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was pleased with the Sahaba, then we will have to do the same. And this is this is what it means, وَرَضُعًا, that they were pleased with Allah. Then after Allah says, وَأَعَدَّ لَهُمْ جَنَّاتٍ تَجْرِي تَحْتَهَا الْأَنْهَارِ That Allah has prepared for them gardens beneath which rivers flow. And these gardens, subhanAllah, the gardens of paradise, the trees of paradise, the palaces of paradise, the rivers will flow be, be, you know, underneath these, these gardens and these uh, these trees and these palaces. Allah says, خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا أَبَدًا They will remain in these gardens forever, never to leave. And this is... This is the greatest blemish and the greatest deficiency of any of the bounties of this world. No matter how much pleasure a person receives from his orchards in this world, from his palaces, and from his kingdoms in this world, and from any materialistic uh, luxury he has in this world, the greatest blemish and the greatest flaw is that he has to leave it. It's that it's not forever. It will deteriorate. And if it doesn't deteriorate, he'll deteriorate before the pleasure, before the luxury. And a person will have to leave it behind when he dies. This is the greatest success and triumph. Of receiving these gardens of, of Jannah and receiving the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give myself and all of us to, um, to understand these verses and to practice them, put them into our lives, and to convey them.